Welcome back to World on Drugs, everybody. I am your host, Steve Fury. Good to see you. We got a hell of a show right now. Our first two-parter. We do a deep dive into white supremacist gangs in America. Groups, neo-Nazis, all that type of stuff. If you want to know where they came from, you know why they started. This is the episode. This is going to be our first two-parter. And why is that? It's because we got a new uh, researcher on. I want to give him a shout-out, Robin Fitch McCullough. My man might have a uh, first name of a woman, but um, he's a badass, ex-military uh, man, um, and he fucking crushed this. We got a new little setup we're doing, new little uh, format. I think you guys are going to really love it. We uh, pump out some information up top, then we do a quick overview so we can learn it better, and we keep doing that throughout. <sighs> Just very happy, you know, this was a great episode. Life's been pretty good for me recently. Um, this guest is Zach Chapelloni, um, Bay Area comic that lives in L.A. You may have seen him on uh, MTV's Party Stories. He was on the last episode of Shameless, that great TV show, the William H. Macy. He uh, closed out that bad boy. He's been in, I mean, if you're in the Bay Area, he's on like every fucking commercial. This guy, to me, is one of the funniest dudes that no one's heard of. A lot like Nick Aragon last week, you know, a guy I'd like to shine some light on. Can I get bigger guests? Maybe, but uh, probably. But, you know, I've noticing that the chemistry with guys that are actually my friends and guys that I find really funny is working a lot better. If you want to check him out more, ch- follow him on Zach Chapelloni on Instagram and follow his podcast, Hesby Street. Uh, great podcast, also uh, co-hosted by Emily Catalano, who's done Conan and also co-hosted by... A friend of mine, Torio Van Grohl, um, had a little bit of allergies for the last couple of days. Um, Torio, I was just with him in San Diego. want to give it a shout out to all our listeners that came out to the San Diego show last Friday, American Comedy Co. We sold it out. I'll probably be back. It was a true blessing. Um, that was a great day, you know. Drew, drove the new Lexus. Not new, but new to me. Bought that bad boy for my birthday. Um, Drove down with my buddy Hormos Rashidi. He's going to be on this podcast. We went down early, got some ceviche at Oscar's Seafood Restaurant, sat by the beach, napped for a couple hours, went to Queen Up. Uh, San Diego is wide the fuck open. They do not care about anything. I mean, they have a Queen Up open. If you know what Queen Up is, that's like a, um, it's a arcade that they serve finger foods at. So imagine if uh, there's a rampant, disease virus going around and people are playing games that they share and then eating chicken wings after but no one got sick can't really blame on anything anybody their numbers seem to be fine and it was a fucking blessing so once again shout out to all you guys who came out it just the world's coming back guys it's coming back and it feels so good and it's weird you know man you just The things that you used to do and take for granted are now treats. And I think it's going to stay for a couple years here that we're going to be remembering how bad it was to stay inside and we're going to be living it, guys. And I think the next three to four years is going to be the roaring 20s. We're all going to have a great time. If you're single, go fucking mouth kiss and bang as many people as you can. If you got a great spouse, go have fun, man. This is the time that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter your ethnicity. Doesn't matter your religion. Go out, have fun, and live your fucking life, guys. This is so great. Had a great time at that show. Um, If you want to see me soon, I will be the week this comes out. 428 to 53 I'll be in San Francisco doing a bunch of shows check my Instagram I'll be there uh doing like three to four shows a night so make sure you go to one if you want to hang out with me or grab a beer after make sure you go to a show that's a little bit later um otherwise man you know the podcast getting bigger help thanks to you guys uh slowly but surely lightweight been thinking about changing the name um, I think World on Drugs is an excellent name, very catchy, but the problem is I feel like if you're scrolling through Spotify or Apple and you're looking at different podcasts, I feel like the name doesn't really say what we're doing. So I have an artist from Portugal uh, revamping a new logo, same woman who did the last one. I mean, honestly, the World on Drugs logo is one of my favorite things about this podcast. And I'm thinking about, you know, just cutting bullshit, cutting any fat, and just calling the podcast Warlords, Drug Dealers, and Criminals. So that when people search, you know, just through Spotify for new podcasts, they can see this, they'll try it out, and they'll see that we now got a backlog about 10, about 10 episodes deep. 
I would say seven to eight are about guys no one's ever heard about or things that people uh, don't know and that we've shined a light on, which is the whole the whole thing about this podcast, man, because I'm tired of hearing about fucking Griselda Blanco and El Chapo. Once again, shout out to my guy, Robin Fitch McCullough. He added a whole new spice to this episode. Hopefully he can keep coming back. He did a great job. The guys, thank you for listening. Um, once again, Zach, one of the funniest comics working today. Check out his podcast. This one is our first two-parter. Um, the information is so um, specific and good that we just had to stretch it out, man. Just had to stretch it out, and I think it's worth it. And it's going to be two episodes now, one this week, one next week. And, you know, we tried to go as unbiased as we can. Listen, you guys know I'm, I'm from California, kind of a libtard cuck. But, you know, the information we got um, were from educational articles, uh, books, independent research. It's not, I'm not trying to push any prop- propaganda or um, points of view. I mean, I do because I'm a guy just talking about shit. But, um this is from what I did my research and another guy spending multiple hours trying to find stuff pretty unbiased and stuff that I think you can take to the bank. And honestly, this is one of my favorite episodes. It's going to be a little bit more um, fact-driven and date-driven than just kind of comedy where some of ours are. But I I mean, if anyone ever wants to talk to you about white supremacist groups or neo-Nazis in America, you're going to have the info. And we go a deep dive, and it was a fucking blast, man. I think you guys are going to really love this episode. Make sure you share it with your friends. You know, it's a secret we have between you and me, but let's get some more people listening here. You know what I mean? Just for us, you know. Let's make it a party. You guys, me, the world. Once again, Zach Chapeloni, follow him. This podcast is going to get good. First, uh, first episode is out now. The second part is going to be out in a week. And after that, we do the Bamboo Union. A Taiwanese gang you never heard of. And we're going to have one of my best buds and Taiwanese comic, uh, Jason Chenny, to kind of explain the whole thing. So guys, sit back, smoke a joint, drink a beer, enjoy this episode, enjoy life. It's coming back and I couldn't be happier. Love you guys. See you at a show soon. What's up, Zach? Thanks for coming in, buddy. <laughs> Yo. Started in hot out of nowhere. You're mid sense. I just came in at you. 100%. Zero to 100. Zero to 100, real quick. Um, this episode, man, is uh, got a, it's going to be an interesting episode. Normally, we try and focus a little more on the funny. This one, we got really in depth on the nuances of white supremacist groups in America and how they came here and the big political people and things that push them to where they are now. I thought you said it wasn't going to be funny. <laughs> yeah, a lot of bits there, a lot of stuff that I'm allowed to talk about. Um, this episode is actually, we got a new researcher this week, uh, Robin Fitch McCullough. That is a man, he is a ex-military guy, he crushed it, uh, but that's why this episode is so detail-laden. Um, we're going to get pretty deep into the stuff and learn a lot. Like, I, like after, like, giving what the researcher gives me and then I do my after stuff, it's like I get scared that I'm going to get on the list after looking up like every oh, yeah. important white supremacist person that's ever lived. Yeah, right, right. And then liking at the bottom <laughs> yeah. of the page. And then subscribing and then sharing it. Just and one then of those random people that comments, great article. <laughs> <laughs> Intuitive and gave me a different way to think about things. So what I'm going to go through in this one, this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to go through a short timeline okay. uh, of these th- pretty much four diff- three to four different eras that uh, Robin has found that the white supremacy came to be. Uh, the first one is going to be the Reconstruction era, and that's kind of the basis of KKK, and it starts around the 1865. Right, post-Civil War. Post-Civil War stuff, stuff's coming back, and uh, it's actually pretty interesting stuff. So what I'll do is I'll go through something, probably like five, ten minutes of some maybe boring stuff, okay. just dates, and then we'll go over synopsis, and feel free to jump in, make anything funny that you can. Um, Dude, I kind of geek out on like random history like this, so I love. That's what I love about what this show does. Like, yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, this one's especially good because there's so much stuff I hadn't learned about, and it's so like every year it gives what their biggest one. So let's just jump into it if you want. Yeah, I might know some. You might know some. Yeah, yeah your name came up quite a bit. A little, <laughs> bit, a little bit scary to be honest with you. <laughs> I was about to say, dude, my mentor. Uh, yeah, he really just yeah. took me. Yeah, David under Duke. His wing. Was you and David Duke? I didn't know you guys were besties. So. We nail it down to it really starting 
this new era of white supremacy and white supremacist groups and Nazi, neo-Nazi stuff to start around December 6th, 1865, when the 13th Amendment ratified prohibiting slavery in the United States. We're pretty much saying it started then because before then, I feel like everyone was just a racist and it wasn't yeah. like white supremacist groups. Right. It was just like the average norm. Right. We're like, oh, that's a group? Yeah, that's a group. <laughs> I thought that was everybody. I thought All that right, was darker. I'll start air breathers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're getting in there. Um, about three weeks later, on December 24th, 1865, Ku Klux Klan is founded as a social club in Pulaski, Tennessee. About three years later, on April on 1867, Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest became the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. The KKK begins tra- targeting African Americans and government institutions across the South. So my favorite thing here is like I feel like I don't know I've been traveling a lot and going to the South yeah. and you always hear like these people are like it was the South didn't secede because of slavery or states' rights it was a taxing thing and it's like oh yeah for sure <laughs> but your general was the first Grand Wizard of the KKK yeah. Right. It's like you guys aligned an awful lot. For yeah, yeah. Nothing to do with each other. It's like, babe, I never cheated on you. I just married the nanny that you thought I was fucking who has a kid just look on me. I freelance at the strip club. It's a side hustle. I'm passionate about my work. I keep the underwear. I wash them for the ladies. I wait. Does it does it say like why Grand Wizard? You know? No, you know what, man? I then started re going through this stuff and adding more stuff. And it just I took wonder this. why they picked that name. Yeah. You know, like instead of like general or. Maybe, I'm thinking maybe in like 1865, the thoughts of maybe a wizard being real was a lot more higher than it is now. <laughs> right. So they were just like Grand Wizard. He might be magical racist powers. It was it was clickbait. Yeah, it was reason. clickbait. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> How can we make people people love to hate black people? People love magic. <laughs> I'm not particularly racist, but you you say there's going to be a wizard at this <laughs> event tonight. A grand <laughs> wizard. All right, let's get into it. Hold on. So July 9th, 1868, the 14th Amendment is ratified, establishing citizenship criteria and equal protection for all citizens other than the law. You can kick this cat off. It's just very nice. Her name's Hallie. In 1868 to 1871, Ulysses S. Grant is elected and uses the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marshals to begin to pursue the Klan. So this is kind of the interesting thing I knew. In the beginning, they were really trying to get rid of these racists in the South. Like, it wasn't so much it was where, like, kind of what we see, honestly, right when this thing ends, that yeah. they kind of just pull out of the South and kind of let it what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Ulysses S. Grant and a lot of these guys, probably because they fought against them in the war, had a lot more, uh, were a lot more pissed off at these guys and wanted to make sure that they weren't doing the shit that they were doing. Right, right. And wouldn't scorched have, Earth. Yeah, Scorched Earth. And they weren't trying to come back to, you know, having to deal with this shit one more time. So, from when, so uh, after Ulysses S. Grant... As the army and the marshals begin to sue the Klan, uh, the 15th Amendment is ratified. The Department of Justice is created to enforce reconstruction policies in the South and combat the KKK. So that's an interesting thing that the I never knew that the Department of Justice, one of their main things was to combat the KKK. Me neither. You know, I mean, because apparently, like from what I understand, the FBI with like Hoover and stuff, he kind of really wanted to uh, subdue African-Americans and black people in them in America. Right. But it seems like, you know, just because, like, the fighting was so fresh in these guys' minds, they really fucking hated. I don't know if they hated people that were racist against black people, but they fucking hated Southerners. Yeah, interesting. And they really start kicking their ass. In 1871, the Klan is largely dismantled by the federal government. Other organizations such as the White League and the Red Search are created in an attempt to suppress black voters and continue their ideologies. So essentially, Klan's cut down, but it splinters into way more things. It's like, how can you stop it? It's like, all right, knock it off. We're going back north, but no more. No more. Yeah, you guys stop. And he's like, okay, he just turns on a different shirt. <laughs> it's like telling you to stop fighting your your cousins <laughs> yeah. or your siblings. It's like, you cannot sell computers anymore. It's the best guy. He takes off wearing a Target shirt. It's like, what? <laughs> But, you know, that's kind of what I've seen in a lot of this shit, man. Mm -hmm. And I'm not to say that one giant evil group is better than when things get splintered into smaller groups. But when you take out the top guy, not often does it just end everything. Yeah. What it does is just splinters in these small, far smaller, more radical, violent groups. Yeah, it's almost like, right, like that's mythical creature. I don't know what it's fucking called, but you cut it off and like two heads come back, you know. Like a worm? No, it's like that that dog thing. Cerberus was the dog, I think. Oh, yeah, Cerberus. Okay, so April 13th, 1873, the Colfax Massacre. Dozens of black militia from the 6th 
Louisiana State Militia Regiment are captured and subsequently massacred by white supremacists in Colfax, Louisiana. Violence between the white supremacists and African Americans and government officials is widespread in the South at this time. Hmm. You're going to see Louisiana, man. They come up a couple times in here on the wrong side. Interesting. Multiple times. They always brag about being like a cultural melting pot. Did you know David Duke was a fucking senator there? No. Yeah, for 40 years. Holy shit. Yeah, after he... he well, we'll get into David Duke later. Uh, this is a huge one, and when we're actually going to do a little deep dive in, because I never heard about this. September 14th, 1874, the Battle of Liberty Place. White supremacists temporarily overthrow the government of Louisiana, but order is restored when the U.S. Army and Navy reoccupy the city. That it's is like the Capitol storming. It's all exactly over again. like the Capitol. What we're going to hear is pretty much exactly like this. Because right now we're going to go a lot deeper into this. Because like I said, you know, there's so much shit in the white supremacist thing that it's, you go real quick. But some of these we got to go. Gotta, right, 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 right. Got to go a little deeper. I, I hear you. I mean, the only difference is like the Capitol storming was. There was a reason. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. You know, and these an guys, election was stolen, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> and QAnon, the pedophiles, are taking everybody. Right. I save mean, our children. So save our children, for sure. Oh, man. By the end of the... So now we're going to uh, tell what everybody... Uh, explain to you what the Battle of Liberty Place is. Okay. White supremacists overthrow the government of Louisiana, September 14th, 1874. By the end of the Civil War in April 1865, the United States Army had grown from a small volunteer force of 16,000 men to a modern machine comprised of over 600,000 veterans and conscripts. Through fighting petered out after Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, the Army and Navy still had to occupy southern cities, perform, per, pursue war criminals, and enforce new laws, chiefly the Emancipation Proclamation and the new amendments to the United States Constitution that ended slavery and promised equal rights to Americans. The task was complicated by resistance by white supremacists, many of who were former Confederate soldiers. Right. That shit would be hard, man. I mean, it's just run it back mentality, like on the courts, you know. Yeah, like, dude, you lost, bro. You gotta you make way. Another team wants to play. It would be like if you like beat up a kid, and then to make sure you never beat him up again, you then lived in his house with all his brothers, <laughs> right? And his parents, the police state, yeah. absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's what these guys felt. I mean, they were wrong, but they probably felt like these motherfuckers killed my family. Right. They're trying to steal my way of life. I mean, they're wrong. Their family they, should have done. Totally. It. But you wake up every day. I mean, and you walk outside and a soldier's fucking yeah. like, keep it moving, dude. Don't fucking try any funny in shit. In your house, dude? Yeah. Woo -hoo, you'll be pissed. Mm -hmm. By the time Ulysses S. Grant was elected in 1868, much of the South had been lost again to vigilantism and insurrection. Newly elected Republican state governments in the army, supported by freed, slaved, and carpet baggers, northerners who immigrated to the south after the war were under siege by white supremacist groups that would be an interesting man i don't I'm, i mean i'm guessing i'd have to learn more and i probably should have looked up more of why the fuck would you move to the south as i know a northerner? i guess business opportunities like yeah you probably like it's like moving out to where you could be the first to open this you yeah know? You or they probably maybe gave tax breaks Right. Maybe they took out some of the head guys of these places that used to be. Yeah. And uh, early gentrification. Mm hmm. White people were already. We, we, we gentrify so much, we gentrify other white people. <laughs> we gentrify the whitest white people. The whitest people you could ever have. Some, such as the outlaw Jesse James, had never stopped fighting the Civil War and had turned their irregular Confederate units into organized gangs engaged in robbery, arson, murder, and theft. I feel like you kind of learn that when you watch these like old timey movies. Mm -hmm. Like the the dudes are kind of always wearing like an old Confederate outfit. Yeah, dusty, dusty. tattered, and the worst man. Like these guys. That's the one thing about the South is like these motherfuckers wearing like wool on wool yeah. outfits. Yeah, layers. People probably Vest. smelled like shit. shit. Like, I don't ever think about that, but, like... I think about it all the time. This They're is a stick-up. You're stuff. like, dude, take whatever you want get out of this train. <laughs> Someone's here. How do you know? I can smell their B.O. It smells very Southern. Yeah, that's one thing that I always listen to and always watch these things. I'm like, God damn, these people fucking sing. And, like, are you, like, banging the same prostitute that everyone's Ooh. banging? It's oh, like, yeah. Oh. I bet you knew there was a whole brothel at a bar once you walked in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's probably the cleanest people, because, I mean, and also I heard, like, you would, like, share bathwater and shit. Right, right. Just a fucking nightmare. Gnarly. Other groups were former Confederates that supported the Democratic Party that opposed Lincoln, and they created their own new military militia organizations. You know, like, back in the day, Republicans and Democrats, it yeah. was a switch kind of thing. Still, others, like the Ku Klux Klan, became engaged in a terrorist campaign against the government and against black communities, as well as the white Northerners and Southern Unionists that supported emancipation. 
Grant's re-election brought a renewed vigor to the fight against white supremacy, but violence only increased. A controversial election in Louisiana in 1872 had seen two rival boards certify the results, one supporting a pro-Grant Republican candidate and the other supporting an anti-Grant Democratic candidate. This kind of seems like exactly what fucking happened. With Trump. With Trump. Yeah. People are, are getting fed information from their only one thing and thinking that it's right. Mm-hmm. Violence peaks with the Colfax Massacre in April 1873 when a group of black U.S. Army troops were attacked and massacred by white militia. The federal government certified the pro-grant candidate, and by 1874, Louisiana was divided with a pro-government legislature r- ruling from City Hall in New Orleans and a separatist faction controlling white rural areas around the city. That's gnarly. Also, the same fucking thing that's now. Yeah. You look at, like, people in cities who really tend to be one way and the people out, and also, like, rough to be, like, just roaming factions of ex-militia going to kill you and do weirdo shit. It's just like, don't go into the woods at night. Don't get yeah, all that stuff, man. It's so scary, too, because these are actually guys, which is something that I found uh, in actually a lot of the other stories, is, like, you can see when these criminals a- criminal organizations take a huge leap is when they start uh, getting ex-military on their on their team. Yeah, because now they have the tactics. Because you got the tactics, you got the not, subordination, like, dudes are, they look to people that are ranked higher than as a thing of authority. They're not going to say it wrong, and they now know how to... You know, go into a building, take it over from different ways. And right. Parts. It's like a full on syndicate. Yeah, that's really it start, starts to take a big bump. And with these roaming psychos around, that's what happens. Perpetrators of the Colfax massacre organized themselves into an organization organization called the White Man's League, also known as hockey NHL. A lot of people <laughs> don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> the White Man's League mustered 5,000 volunteers to march on New Orleans, defending the city where the newly informed and racially integrated New Orleans Metropolitan Police, as well as units of pro-government militia and a company of regular U.S. Army troops and customs officials. Really funny to know that they had a customs officials back then, right? <laughs> like what, what are you searching what for? What is he? Is he just smelling people? Yeah, 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 metal yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where's this fruit from? <laughs> is this fruit from Nepal? I, I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> Guy gave it to me, man. Oh, I don't know. Potato sack. <laughs> My life is terrible. I'm wearing the same underwear I've worn for four years. Please just let me. Please just let me go in here. Ordered to disperse, the White League overran the police and using a captured cannon stormed City Hall. Republican officials, including the governor, took shelter at a customs house which was under siege. Grant ordered two regiments of the U.S. regular infantry, supported by naval gunboats, to reoccupy the city. By the 24th, first, the White League had surrendered their arms and positions with a promise that if they gave up their arms, they would not be prosecuted. What a deal. What a deal. That just doesn't happen anymore. I mean, well, white people still get that one. I know. I feel like a couple of the people on this one kind of got it still. Yeah. Like the last uh, storming? storming of the Capitol. I mean, the the parallels between this and what happened there. I, know, I was just thinking, dude, what if they got a cannon? You know, like. Anyway, cannons would fucking suck, man. Imagine just like whew, a big rock comes through your house, destroys everything. Yeah. And you're like, and the amount of time that it takes to reload that, you're like, is it done? Yeah. Are they still firing giant rocks into and my moving house? moving it? You know, and the moving? whole new neighborhood would be like, bro, there's a fucking cannon. They're moving towards City Hall. <laughs> no, Come there's watch. not. I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I should have believed you about the cannon. So uh, after they su- submit, uh, give up their their arms and, just, and because they're not going to be prosecuted. Right. Oh, so they did take the deal. Yeah. 32 men had died, though. And for a further two years, the city was under military occupation. By 1891, white supremacists had successfully taken over the legislature, constructing a monument to the White League in the heart of New Orleans. It was not removed until 2017. Dude, I remember actually my brother who's lived there for like 10 years, him and his girlfriend went to the protest of that statue. And I was like, what is that like? He's like, dude, there is some deep fucking history here that I don't even know as like a California boy, but it's fucking intense. And that's crazy to think that like they got shut down like a police state and they're like, we're building this statue. And it's like, all right, build your fucking statue. Like, yeah, why I mean, are you letting them still do anything? What happened? They're so a terrorist organization. 15 years later, they were able to take over the legislator and cons- legislature and construct a monument to the White League in the heart of New Orleans. And then I remember, see, though, p- when people paint this shit of, like, removing 
historical monuments and stuff, they're just they go like, ah, eh, this might be racist. But if someone was just was like, hey, this was a monument put up to people who attacked the fucking U.S. government. Yeah. Who could say that they needed this up? Yeah. And they lost. Yeah. And, and they, they were fucking shameful. Yeah. And then, they're like, all right, well, we're going to I mean, it would be like if a group of extremist Muslims were like, let's build an Osama statue. Yeah. You know, it's like, bro, they took no. over Detroit and then it built <laughs> yeah. Osama bin Laden. You're the you. bad guy. No. And people are like, no, no, you, you can't take down it's our history. history. Yeah. We're all read about that shit. We don't need to put it up. Right. March 4th, 1877, pro- President William Hayes withdraws U.S. troops from the South in exchange for Democratic support, leaving white supremacists largely in control of state capitals in the former Confederacy. So that's kind of how. Like I said, Ulysses S. Grant, all these guys were just, they were like, bam, get these motherfuckers out, get these motherfuckers out, get these motherfuckers out. Then this guy, William Hayes, who I've never heard of in my life, no idea he was a president, um, yeah. he takes those guys out and he says, just support me. So then now the shit can fester, the people can get into higher ports of the government. Dude, that is, I mean, the parallels here with now are yeah. crazy, bro. Yeah. It's you, like hard not to talk. Like, I don't want this to be about politics now, but there's no way that yeah. like it's not history repeating itself. Yeah, I'm not going to say on whose side, or, but this stuff does seem uh, like it happened recently. Yeah. And there is that, no matter what. So, I mean, and I didn't get this information, and neither did uh, my guy Robin. We didn't get it from MSNBC or CNN or yeah, anything like that. Right. We got these from educational articles and independent things research independent research so if you guys want to check out any of the stuff uh our references you know i put that at the end so that's the beginning that's it right there so dude we need to like educate people on william hayes i swear because that lesson of like there's always going to be some guy that's like dude i'll take the power and yep. break every rule in the book if i get to be the most fucking like the strongest guy to back. And that's literally what our whole politics is based on right now is a guy being like, all right, I'll let you drill wherever you want. Yeah. But you got to put me. <laughs> and, then, right. and it's like, no, we fought f- so that he couldn't drill anymore. Oh, right. You're right. fucking us. It's just benefiting you. you. Only you. But then he like pretends to be. I mean, like, I'm not saying Biden's not a part of this either. No, you know? totally. Fuck Biden. Fuck totally. all those people. The deals they make mm-hmm. just to keep their names at yep. the top of the list. So the overview so we're here for the overview, the ideology of white supremacy in the American Civil War, 1860 to 1900. Slavery and white supremacy was enshrined in the constitutions with the three-fifths clause that counted unfree persons as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of appropriationing membership in the U.S. House of Representatives during the census. Protecting white supremacy and slavery was the primary motive of Southern secessionists leading up to and during the Civil American War. Ending slavery and white supremacy in the South becomes the primary motive of the U.S. government in the Civil War, first as a means to destroy the willpower and infrastructure of the South, and secondarily to establish a more equal system of government and represent, that represented the ideals enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. So that's, that's what I kept saying, you know? It just seemed like, honestly, it seemed like in the beginning of this shit, the government had it good. Like, like we're doing the right shit. We're really trying... Yeah. To no, fix it. a noble cause. Yeah. yeah. As they always start out. Yeah. And then that fucking William Hayes cunt left the fucking place. Yeah, but I'm sure there were people. I mean, it's just when you're the minority, yeah. you know, like there were probably racist white people in the North that were like, all right, well, I mean, I'm probably just, I'm every- not going to speak up. Yeah. It's not trending right now. I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like I don't want to be canceled, dude. Uh huh. Yeah, just canceled back then. It's just like a, a crow brings you a letter that everyone knows <laughs> now that you were canceled. Yeah, like, I mean, definitely everyone back there, probably even you'll see, there were, like, white supremacists in the sense that they probably thought they were better than than black people or minorities, but they just weren't for... I mean, the fact that they agreed on three-fifths of a person means pretty much everyone was like, look, they're not people, but they shouldn't be slaves. (laughs) It's weird that that's a number. I know, three-fifths. Because then it's also like, is that to prevent two people from getting together to count as one vote? It's like, uh, no, now you're like one and some change. change. That's and too we, many. Want, we want a nice round. Yeah. I love they're just like every black person equals a white guy with no arms or legs. <laughs> so use that. The assassination by L- of Lincoln by a northern white supremacist complicates this task. 
Former Confederates and white supremacists actively undermine efforts to rebuild the South along new lines. Chief among the antagonists are the Ku Klux Klan. Founded as a social club, the organization quickly becomes the primary advocate for violence against the government, institutions controlled by the federal government and the Republican Party, as well as newly freed slaves. The elections of Ulysses S. Grant in 1868 sees the South placed under military occupation for the second time. Though the Ku Klux Klan is effectively dismantled, other organizations take its place. Many former Confederates opposed the new state governments, such as Jesse James. They turned to smuggling and robbery mm -hmm. in Louisiana. The state government is overthrown by white supremacists. This process continues until 1877, when the last federal troops, troops occupying the South are withdrawn. Over the ensuing decades, white supremacists take control of the state legislators and usher in the era of Jim Crow. Yeah. So they, they, they aren't going out down without a fight, dude. No, they but fucking did it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, they... They learned, you know, from, all right, like, robbing banks isn't really doing much. You know, like, the Jesse James model isn't lasting. Yeah, that long. one's not doing good. Yeah, but maybe we could, like, run for office, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I mean, also, you know, to say, like, when the fucking guys took over the Louisiana state government and no one gets in trouble, yeah. maybe that lays a fucking, a fucking ground that if you fuck up and mm -hmm. you just hold your ground, you might be okay. Like, maybe if those guys were all... Killed, killed. Yeah, I mean executed. But then you're arguing like, is that exactly? It's a s slope that now the government can execute pay people that are going against it. I don't necessarily agree with that. Do I think that if these group of guys that did that shit would have been murdered, could have been better? I don't know. It's like I, I personally think they should have been murdered. Yes. But I also understand that by doing that, you're also setting uh, you're creating uh, martyrs. Yeah, and you're creating this thing. Like now, these guys aren't just like dumb racists that did a thing they're like you know the saint john billy bob johnny boy you know yeah like, people now look up to this person which another and they're clearly not going to stop gathering yeah. you know like the fear won't ever shake that out of them it's just they gather more secretly yep all right Bam. Okay, so we're going to go now to the next era, which is nazism and white supremacy in the united states which goes about 1910 to the 1940s it really all pops off with the banger, everyone's favorite movie, Birth of a Nation, mm. is released. Uh, this renewed interest in the KKK, uh, and it sees itself reformed as a popular white and Protestant national movement focusing on white supremacy, anti-Semitism, anti-immigration, and anti-Catholicism. It reaches membership estimated at a 5 million across the country at this time. So if you don't know what Birth of the Nation is, it's like the f one of the first biggest Hollywood movies that was just racist as fuck. Uh, it was originally called The Klansman, a 1915 American silent drama directed by W.D. Griffith and starring Lillian Gish. The screenplay is adapted from Thomas Dixon's 1905 novel uh, and play The Klansman. Griffin's also co-wrote the screenplay. So what happens is this is a landmark film. It was the first 12 real film ever made, and it was three hours. Snyder Cut. Snyder Cut. That's <laughs> <laughs> released straight to HBO Max. The first director had to go, dude. Once fucking D.W. Griffith or whoever the fuck got involved. He fucked us. Yeah, he's the guy who gave us the deleted scenes that ruined movies. It, it like I think it won an Oscar. I know it's Oscars I tonight. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it was like, maybe not an, I didn't think they had the Oscars back then, but it award? was like. Well, I think it was like the biggest, I think, wasn't it the one where you see that moon and that thing goes in its eye? Was I think that was Birth of a Nation. Uh, I know that it's, I've seen clips of it and it's basically about like black people are trying to fuck all the white women. Yes. And like a hero rises up. So the, up. the film was controversial before its release and has remained so ever since. It had been called the most controversial film ever made in the United States. Lincoln is portrayed positively, unusual for a narrative that promotes the lost cause ideology, a.k.a. Yeah, white supremacist stuff. The film portrays African Americans who are played by white actors in blackface as unintelligent and sexually aggressive, aggressive towards white women. The film presents the Ku Klux Klan as a heroic force necessary to preserve preserve American values and a white supremacist social order. It's crazy to like write that as an idea in any time. And I mean, it gives you a glimpse into how the world felt, you know, for that movie to do so well. It means that people are like, you know, they're not talking about this enough. Yeah. Like that was a concern of theirs. Just black people running amok. 
and just fucking like white women, women and taking them. Yeah, the, like the, by the, force. The scared thing of a lot of weak white men, you know, not every white guy's weak. I'm yeah. white. I love me. I right. Like a lot of, but like of just scaring that like black people are gonna fuck their girlfriends is like the weirdest. Yeah, it's, it's kind a, of a through line that I feel like has been throughout. And it's also like, bro, your girl wanted. Yeah, if fuck your girl. <laughs> I don't think it's his fault. I don't think I blame McDonald's when she gets a McFlurry. And I'm like, <laughs> right. oh, Mc, McDonald's just offered my girlfriend McFlurries. It's like, no, she wanted a fucking McFlurry. Right. She just sat in the drive-thru and waited for them to repair the machine. <laughs> she looped. <laughs> she looped a couple times to make sure that machine would work. November 16th, 1925. David... Stevenson, Grand Dragon of the Indiana Clan, is arrested for rape and murder. Nationally, the KKK rapidly recedes in popularity to just 30,000. Whoa. So that, yeah, went from like 5 million to, I mean, 5 million, it went from what, 5 million, 1915 to 10 years. Wow, that's that motherfucker took a deep dive. So at, what, 1915, uh-huh. white supremacy, uh, Five million. KKK is at five million, which has got to be most of the United States. I mean, how much was our population at that time? Yeah. I, d- I honestly, I'm bad at population numbers. But what's weird to me is like uh, the. It couldn't have all been from that rape murder. No, I'm guessing it was just going down just because shit's just not as it was like like fucking MySpace. You know what I mean? Right. It was popping for a long time. Like, all right. Think, we're here. Yeah. Like, I mean, Tom raped some people, but that's not why I got <laughs> off. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just looking back. <laughs> it's always trying to be your friend <laughs> until it's too late. Um, so in nineteen f- or February twenty fourth, nineteen twenty, the National Socialist German Workers Party f- is formed in Munich. Got a bad feeling about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. I'm not going to give any spoilers. But, promising uh, start. Promising start. They had some good ideas in the beginning, but then they took a weird turn. Actually, they made up bad ideas the whole time. I'm, not as familiar actually i don't know i don't know i think it was like decent but like a lot of times any socialist kind of thing in the beginning it seems like a great i always understood as like you hang out with a guy like dude this guy's the best he's 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 super fascinating and you're just hanging out at a party telling great stories and you're like well yeah and then at the end of your stories are like this guy rules man you're right zach steve is the shit and then you're like and also we need to exterminate jews (laughs) like Whoa, whoa, also, whoa. Steve was great, and then for five years he got really addicted to meth, and his views got really <laughs> fucking weird. So, but I'm still on board. I'm still know? on board. <laughs> He's I don't, helping a lot, dude. I feel like a lot of the things that's really wrong with people. I forgot I never put on the right background. That really wrong is they can never. Is people would rather go down on a sinking ship than ever admit that they were wrong, dude. I never understand that. Like loyalty isn't as fucking sexy anymore. No, like well, I mean, like it, like I'm just like if if something's wrong, like I I like bite. I mean, I voted for Biden, but I don't think he's a like great human grace. being. Yeah, right. Like, if people were like, hey, we have a new guy that doesn't have a weird checkered past, and we have to burn Biden at the stake, I'd be like, I got a fucking fire log that I can right. start and self-burns. A lot of people were like, yo, Trump, uh, you know, like, it'd be like, oh, Trump's boys with Epstein. And they'd be like, yeah, Clinton, too. Yeah, I'm like, we're like kill yeah, Clinton, yeah, too. Yeah, I don't give them. a fuck. Fuck all like, these come people. Come get him. He's not my guy. Right. What do you think we're doing over here? Yeah, so that's the weirdest one for me is just a lot of these guys, they don't seem to give up stuff. And just like, you know, you met Steve, you had some good ideas at a party, and then once mm-hmm. you start smoking meth, maybe jump off the bandwagon. Yeah, a little bit. January 1933, the Silver Legion of America, a.k.a. the Silver Shirts, is formed in emulation of Hitler's brown shirts, the German storm hey. troopers, and Mussolini's black shirts, Italian fascist nationalist parties. So don't trust organizations based on their shirts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My eyes are out on Best Buy and Target. I'm keeping your eye out. <laughs> right, Geek Squad. Geek Squad. <laughs> <laughs> if you see me a Walmart employee, I will fuck that guy up. Yeah. What if UPS is just a secret faction of uh, the brown shirts? <laughs> the brown shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this have a broken star of David on my <laughs> my fucking what's the, what's this what's what's the fruit that comes like flowers edible arrangements? Okay, <laughs> April to May 1933, sometime in this party, a white supremacist group called Friends of New Germany and later the German American Bund is formed in New York. 1941, about 42 federal agents disrupt and dismantle pro-Nazi organizations. They are aided by public sentiment denouncing fascism made by prominent prominent German Americans. In 1944, the KKK files for bankruptcy and is disbanded. 
So that's the end of the second part. Okay, a couple interesting things here, which two things I will find that always kind of I find interesting. And the first one is a lot of white supremacist organizations go bankrupt. Like they got like an LLC or mm. something. And I don't 100% under, I mean, but yeah. it just be a white thing. Like we Filing just incorporate. Day is weird. You know, like working as a clerk, you're like, you will not believe who I just fucking signed off for a yeah. business permit. <laughs> Listen, we got to stop buying black jackets and Doc Martin boots. <laughs> they are bearing us. We have no money for small bats and I would have loved to be a fly on the wall the day that the KKK meets. I'm like, guys, I... I don't know. We I don't think we can sell enough brownies this Sunday <laughs> to keep us above water. The accountant for the KKK, they're like, listen, we hate Jews, but we do need an accountant. So Barry <laughs> Levenstein, come on up here and tell us <laughs> why we can't stay in the black. The numbers do not lie, unfortunately. <laughs> not like those dirty damn Jews. <laughs> <sighs> So they file for bankruptcy and they are disbanded, which is, you know, this is the second time. We're only in 1944 that the KKK has been disbanded and has done nothing. Yeah. So, bam. What a, like, uh, rise and fall constantly. Like, five million to just zilch. Also, bankruptcy is, like, one of those things that people use as, like, a get-out-of-jail-free yes. card. So but it I don't doesn't know if- mean they're failing. It just means that they're like, all right, we're going to fucking hit the reset button on this whole thing. And also, they, they did that in 1944, to so to say, I don't know, when is the Depression? I think right then, right? I don't really know. When the Depression, uh, like the 20s. I don't either. I don't I either. Um, but also, like, you know, if you're a business and you're just, like, greasing the palms of politicians, like, you're not... How do you file that? Yeah, I mean, a lot... I mean, how do you file anything that the KKK does? I right. Think they're, I mean, the, do they have, like, a fucking bread store or some shit? Like, what are they? Right, their accountants just like, okay, they? let me see your last hate rally. Uh, show me the... <laughs> okay, I can deduct gasoline for the cross, I think. <laughs> it's like they run it like a fucking... Uh, Oh God! What's like? What's one like one of the weight trainer things? Uh, Pyramid schemes? Herbalife? They run like a Herbalife thing. <laughs> Frank, if you don't get six other racists in here to buy a f- matching hats, it doesn't work. Without does six it, other <laughs> if you do, then you will. This organization will die, Henry. You want them to win? You want them to win, Henry? <laughs> We're gonna need you to get five more cases of anti-black <laughs> protein powder. Overview, Nazism and white supremacy in the United States, 1900 to 1950. The years following the reestablishment of white supremacy over the South are marked by segregation, lynching, mob violence, and disenfranchisement. Following the 1915 release of W.B. Griffith's film Birth of a Nation, interest in white supremacy in the Ku Klux Klan become a nationwide phenomenon. A national organization is created opposed not only to the not only to um, African American equality, but also to Catholicism, Judaism, and immigration. I love how like at, at, over time, I feel like they were like, "All right, Catholics are okay." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like everyone. But I'm stopping there. Yeah, I was, <laughs> we we're not giving you the Jews, and we're got. <laughs> and like also, imagine being against immigration in 1950. I was thinking that one, dude. Like. How long has it been? Like, your grandpa came. Everyone's grandpa at that point. Yeah, is an immigrant. Also, a lot of land. <laughs> right. Not much going on right. most places. Right. I don't even think in 1950 if they're really coming to California Have you gone much. west enough? I yeah. know. It's like there are people that are here still. It's insane. The end of the first world. You know, it's what it is. It's just people with crazy racist ideologies getting people to be on their side by putting up a fake fucking enemy for you all to go behind. Not mm-hmm. you all people listening but people that are into it the end of the first world war is marked by some of the worst cases of racial violence in the united states history including the tulsa race riots and the rosewood massacre in which entire african-american communities are uprooted and or killed slaughtered slaughtered yeah uprooted was a little bit too nice yeah by the 20s the kkk counts more than 50 or no sorry count more than five million members in its ranks david stephenson one of the most influential leader influential leaders of the clan is arrested in 1925 for rape and murder when he begins to cooperate with police investigations into prominent clans members support for the clan evaporates whoa he flipped on he flipped on all of his people which they always flip oh well, it's like a scorsese film dude. yeah it's, it's like, like uh, goodfellas or something or that show f- 48 hours where yeah. the guy always just ends up riding on all his friends for right. 48 hours. Right. It's like, 
instead of him having like <laughs> a nickname, it's just like his name's Kenneth. Yeah, <laughs> Billy, B- Kenneth, Bob, Thompson, and he ratted all the friends. By the Tucker. end, of, Tucker, Tucker, <laughs> Hunter. By the end of the decade, the clan counts for only thirty thousand members. I mean, shit, that's only five years that they went down. Like we we're talking about earlier, you know, I don't remember reading the thing that he ratted on everybody, but that's a reason that you quit an organization. Yeah, as if the leader was the guy ratting on everybody. Well, and I also wonder if it's like, dude, now you're like murdering and burning down cities. Like, these guys are, you know, descendants of Civil War, you know, veterans. Like, those things, I don't care how much you hate, like, that'll fucking burn something and even, like, some of the worst people. You know, like, kids and families and civilians just being killed. So maybe it could have just been like, what are we doing? Like, yeah, I hate them, but Jesus Christ, like it's not seeming to work. I don't want to burn down another city and yeah, kill yeah, yeah. everyone in sight or again. have to do this myself. And now I have to send my kids again because yeah. uh, the shit I read about the fucking Civil War, that shit was gnarly. Yeah. Just dudes getting hit by fucking marbles and it just blows them up and they fucking die because oh. no, one has, no one knows medicine yet. <laughs> so you just have like some nurse who knows nothing cutting your leg off. Right. Fuck that. With the onset of the Great Depression, I knew that was there. Many Americans turned to the example set by Nazi Germany. In 1933, January, the Silver Legion, or Silver Shirts, are formed. They advocate for a new state aligned with Nazi Germany and for white supremacy. It is the first mo- movement to nationally advocate for a form of Christian identity. Listen, okay, I grew up Christian. I grew up Catholic with a lot of Christian uncles. And they're, it, white, it does seem like white supremacists try to grab on to Christian ideology over and over again. I'm not uh, saying Christians are racist at all. I'm mm-hmm. saying a lot of racists happen to be, my, seem, apparently seem to be Christian yeah. for some reason. And, you know, I somewhat practice Christianity, but it's just like weird. I don't know why. Th- I don't know why so a re- religion based on helping poor people. Yeah. And religion how- in general, it's just like, I think it, it's like you're showing yourself as a mark. Yeah, you know they're like, oh, dude, this guy might be able to get tricked into something. They, they think some guy named Jesus Christ <laughs> died and fucking rose out of the, out of a That's cave. Good. Let me tell you about this guy, Ulysses S. Grant, who was a real piece of shit. Simultaneously, ethnic German Americans formed the American Great American Bund, a to provide support to Nazi Germany and advocate for German Is that interests. Is the Bund cake place down That's the street? <laughs> they make such Best delicious cakes. cakes. I love the No Blacks Bund, which is a <laughs> vanilla cake. I love the Mexican Bund, which is a horchata flavor. Uh, you can't cake. go wrong with the white. Just the white the white, bund. white bund. <laughs> White sugar with white flour and white butter. They have ties to the American First Movement, which advocates for the U.S. to stay out of any war with Germany and maintain good relations with Hitler's Germany. After Pearl Harbor, these organizations are pursued by the FBI and military intelligence. By 1944, all are dismantled and the KKK file for bankruptcy. I mean, imagine having the balls to run a pro-Germany, Nazi Germany group in America right. when we're fighting the Germans. Yeah. I mean, you really got to stand for that shit. Like, you really, that has to be, like, your favorite team. You yeah. Know? I mean, and it makes no, like, no one you meet is on your side. Right, right. It's it's something you got to keep to yourself, <laughs> for sure. She's like, Steve loves these silver shirts. He doesn't yeah. really talk about what they mean. <laughs> right. But he's fucking silver shirted out. Yeah, that is an intense fucking stance to take. Yeah, especially when it's happening, like in the thing, like Nazi obviously sympathizer. Yeah. You're a Nazi sympathizer during the Nazis when everyone's family members are getting killed. Just a weird one to go, man. Yeah, they're like, "Sorry about your son, Mrs. Lewinsky." But would you like to read Not this pamphlet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Goldschmeins didn't work out. Wow, crazy! I have some pamphlets you guys might want to read. Fought for the wrong side. What was that, Carl? <laughs> wrong side. I think you're on the wrong side. You're on the side. The emergence of modern white supremacy movement, 1950s to the 1960s. This one kind of actually goes to the 70s. But um, this is when it starts getting a little bit less uh, old-timey shit that I don't really care about, too. A lot more interesting. A lot more uh, relatable. Okay. Not so much being a white supremacist, but uh, what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, more. have you had a hard time relating up until now? <laughs> I've been loving it. I've been in. I've been like, how do I buy a silver shirt in bulk? I've been holding back from finishing every sentence you've read. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Early 1950s, white supremacist groups in Birmingham resurrect the KKK as a decentralized terrorist organization promoting white pride and racial segregation. They begin a bombing campaign against mixed race neighborhoods as well as black churches, businesses, and social organization. And how you can't, and how you could see that not being evil. Dude, straight up terrorism at the core of its definition. Yeah, and like not even like, you know, okay. I've always said this thing on this podcast is about crime. I've always felt if if you if you do crime or you do this thing, you're in a game. A game. So mm-hmm. what happens to you in the game, you know, it happens, you know. But like like if like if like these racist organizations were attacking like I don't know, maybe some black supremacist racist group or not racist but weird groups or something like that, it would be a little bit more uh Right, gang, like kind of, yeah, I know what you mean. You know what I mean? It's like, like when it's gang, not tit for tat. When no, you're, just, you're like attacking black churches, businesses, and social organizations. You're just like, it's you're evil. like, well, they started it by flourishing. Yeah. <laughs> Someone trying to not be slaves, and then it's like, all right, maybe a car club? I don't know. I'm trying to sympathize anyway, but it's like, it just seems straight evil at every point of the way. The the level of anger and like, like to be so upset with where your situation is in life, to be like, you know what, whose fault it probably is. It's that church. Yeah, the church thing, too. And it's also like, like I said, a lot of these in the beginning and kind of still now, for some reason, I'm not saying all Christians are fucking racist. I yeah. know they're not. I have a lot of Christian family members and yeah. pastors. I know they're not racist. But they, it's like if you're a white guy trying to be Protestant or whatever, and then you're bombing other churches, like, I mean, I guess you could say the same right. with Israel. Stop saying, like, Islamic Jesus people. is your God. Yeah. You know it's like, because I mean? he wouldn't have done this. Right. He would right. have never said to bomb black churches and social organizations. Right. May 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the modern r- civil rights movement begins and legal segregation by race begins to dismantle uh, everything. So this is where people start, um, you know, going coming mixing together, schools, mixing yeah. schools. And I, I would have been like, you know, people, I, I would have been like racist if I grew up there because it's just like the mob mentality. Like your whole town is like this and you're a kid growing up and you're like, well, mom and dad are right. You know, it took extra courage for people to be like the the few people who like stood up and defended them. Yeah. Because I mean, people who say that they grew up back then and be like, no, I would never have been racist. It's like, insane. Bro, we're all such weak minded people. Yeah. It's, no like, it's like if it's like a, if you ever it's like being in L.A. and everyone's a Lakers fan. You meet a Clippers fan. You're like brave. <laughs> <laughs> one out of a million. No yeah. one's like you. And I'm not going to sit near you. I'm not going to sit near <laughs> you. And I will burn, bomb your bur- church. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, no, 100%. You know, it's just the sentiment at the time was this way, and it's a fucking. Dude, I mean, the videos I've seen of like those moms crying, like, stop that bus. It's like, whoa, man. Talk about wrong side of history. My God. And just, it's just make up these things that you thought would happen. Yeah. So weird. So they start uh, they start uh, unsegregating schools. 1950 about 1960s, the American Nazi Party is formed by George Lincoln Rockwell. It's formed in large part in opposition to the civil rights movement. Uh, his party replaces Sig Heil with white power as their slogan. Subtle, you know, Sig Heil. <laughs> I, I love. No, no, I mean something different. Let's <laughs> get. I love how I love his advertising group. You know, he's like, "Sig how we're getting some bad uh, feedback. We're thinking white powered work with our 18 to 35 <laughs> demos of sad, balding white men. You're like, oh. What do you mean? Uh, Hitler was right. Is It's an old family <laughs> jingle. We don't it has nothing to do with what you're thinking. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> My family is a lot of Hitlers and a lot of rights. The right brothers. <laughs> also, you know, never, you know, George Lincoln Rockwell. What I've learned in a lot of these things is. uh don't trust a white guy with three names. Yeah, absolutely not. He's either going to assassinate one person who's powerful or a lot of people. Yeah, or he's like eating people or keeping their bodies in like his basement or starting a neo-political neo-Nazi group. Yeah, you're like, God, I'm sorry about those missing kids. Well, we got the Clemens family across the street. <laughs> we got uh, old Todd Vanderbee, you know, he, he coaches the local youth group. And then uh, George Lincoln Rockwell, <laughs> that old boarded up house, the house over there. We don't want to say, I don't know who it could be. <laughs> But uh, start with three names first. Um, so George Lincoln Rockwell was born March 9th, 1918, and he lived to August 25th, 1967. So not very long, about 55 years. He was an American politician and neo-Nazi. In 1959, he was discharged from the United States Navy because of his political views and then founded the American Nazi Party. Imagine how 
I mean, imagine being in the United States Navy and wanting to be a Nazi during 1959, I think. Oh, that's 60s, so that's both the World Wars are over, I believe. So, like, you're, you're, you're on the wrong side of every person I around mean, you. To have to get thrown out of the Navy just because they're like, you're just a lot, dude. <laughs> Just a yeah, timeout. You show up on time. I get it. You make your bed. You do all this, the stuff. You know, but your belief, like between the ears, I got worries, man. A little heavy on the Hitler. <laughs> Just wrong crowd. We can hear you praying to Hitler at night in the <laughs> submarine. <laughs> oh, what a fucking psycho! Rockwell denied the Holocaust and believed that. Imagine being in 1959, yeah, and denying the Holocaust. Like I see these guys now, and it's like obviously the Holocaust is real. I'm not doing that, but it's like I was never alive. I don't know any Jewish that many Jewish people with the things on their the tattoos on the wrist. So it's like more plausible to deny something that happened. Yeah, where that you no haven't one been you know. educated. Educa- on, but this guy was like there, there. You had, you're working with dudes. It's it's the equivalent of like the the uh like Sandy Hook deniers. They're like yeah. going to people's houses, being like, "Your kid didn't die," and it's like, "All right, man, leave me." Like, you tilt his wreath on my front door. Yeah, I don't know what Timmy to James. tell you anymore. He's he's a fucking wacko. Crazy man, this guy was a fucking psycho. So should've Rockwell died sooner should I mean, a lot of these guys are, you know, just fucking morons. Uh, Rockwell denied the Holocaust and believed that Martin Luther King Jr. was a tool for Jewish communists waiting to rule the white community. God, he, I'm so glad he. This guy never found the internet. <laughs> yeah, or he would have been on 4chan right now. <laughs> Dude, he would have ran that shit. He blamed the civil rights movement on the Jews. Personally, I would have said blacks, but that's just me. Yeah. Um, he regarded Hitler really as, reaching. Really reaching, yeah, just throwing things at the <laughs> Jews. So weird. I was like, how are Jewish people not? I mean, everyone always has hated Jewish people throughout history, but it's like, how are they not white people? I've never seen a white. I, when I look at a white, when I look at a Jewish person, I'm like, that's the whitest person I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, right. I'm not like. Whoa, no white people in the crowd tonight at this Jewish fucking... (laughs) Mexican? (laughs) Mexican, Mr. Robenstein? No, that's fucking the whitest person I've ever seen. Yeah, it is weird. He regarded Hitler as the white savior of the 20th century. He viewed black people as primitive, lethargic race who denied who desired only simple pleasures in a life of irresponsibility. To be honest, that sounds like me. Dude, absolutely. I am lethargic. Lethargic, and I just want to have a life of no responsible. My thoughts throughout this podcast will tell you I'm primitive. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm pounding uh, bargain bin tequila reading about (laughs) white supremacists. I'm about as primitive as I can. And he supported the resettlement of all African Americans in a new African state to be funded by the U.S. government, which is the thing that I do see these guys really pushing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't so much kicking out of our like our country; it was just like everyone has to go to like Iowa and live in this weird. Well, Liberia was a country that they like made in Africa. That was like that's for you to go back. That was like the you don't like it country. Yeah, no, you're right. I was wrong on that one. And they're doing great, so that's good for them. Yeah, shout Not out to Liberia. Liberia's doing terrible. As a supporter of racial segregation, he agreed and quoted many black leaders of the black nationalism movement, such as Elijah Muhammad and early Malcolm X. In later years, Rockwell became increasingly aligned with other neo-Nazi groups, including including the World Union of National Socialists. So this little part is uh, I found interesting. What comes next here? On August 25th, 1967, Rockwell was shot and killed in Arlington by John Patler, a disgruntled former member of of his party fuck it'd be your own it'd be your own you know keep your friends close your enemies closer so i did a little research on john palter and uh he's kind of just a normal sad racist guy his dad killed his mom he kind of was brought up by his brothers he became an american nazi i did find this very hilarious and emasculating of this fucking loser palter so after the murder of oh not patler the other guy Oh, no. After the murder of Patler, who's the guy up here that died? Oh, uh, uh, George Rock- Lincoln Rockwell. Okay. Yeah. After the murder of Rockwell, Patler later described his relationship with Rockwell in very enduring terms, stating, I loved him like a father and he loved me like a son. In his last known letter to Rockwell, Patler wrote, I don't think there are two people on earth who think and feel the same way as we do. You are a very important part of my life. I need you as much as you need you me without you there is no future three words they be fucking they be like yeah yeah i got a i i got a i got i got a big uh vibe of stand by eminem 
<laughs> I honestly think like uh, Dido's about to sing any second right now. I think that. they had like some sort of sex thing going on, and that's you know who you get as like the most hateful racists are yeah. uh, like Gay repressed, denying. repressed uh, homosexuals who like don't know how to you know they they think of themselves as like the devil, uh, and they're trying to like clean no, themselves. Great, great, and then and then like people with fucked up family lives that don't know what to believe in they'll believe in the first thing you throw at them it's the same with like radical islam you know they're they're getting like poor villagers who have like nothing yeah and then they're like and then maybe the america this? bombed their thing their cut little town and be a hero save yeah. our, our our people and it's like well damn dude i haven't no one in life has asked me to do yeah. anything else um so he seems like the perfect guy to not only join rockwell's group but to also end up fucking killing him probably because he caught rockwell like Spending too much time with another dude. Oh, I think he said he was going to like socialist, like Bolshevik. I don't whatever that meant. Like, yeah, listen, I'm not a genius, guys. I just research stuff and add it and whatever. These yeah, guys yeah, do. yeah. But uh, yeah, he was going to Bolshevik, which is I think it was socialism and communism, and he didn't like it. Damn. It's just fucking it's an interesting relationship that I'd like to know more about. Patler and Rockwell. Yeah, just it, there's there's a gay thing going on, I think, and I think he's just like nah, he's. They're like, dude, you're just mad because he doesn't like hold your hand after the meetings. He's like, no, he's no. Bolshevik. Yeah, just <laughs> think about it. <laughs> he's making it worse. He's Somal. He has ties to Somalia. <laughs> and his friends and he's been holding someone else's hand after <laughs> after a meeting. Right. The early 1960s, federal and state. Pro- oh, this one was great, and I never thought of it. And it was one of the most interesting things I heard of in the 1960s. Federal and state prisons are ordered to be desegregated. Gangs are immediately formed along racial lines and spread from prison system into the public. I never thought about prisons being segregated back then. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I think of them segregated now because, like, the odd man out is going to get shanked. Yes. Well, that's what kind of went into this thing. And what really, I mean, what really did the Aryan Brotherhood is what funds, not funds, but is really the backbone of most, most normal or more now current day uh white supremacist organizations are going from them and mm. that all came from this from gang from prisons being desegregated that is it that is an interesting move where you probably feel like you're saving the world you yep. know like dude change is coming desegregate hey open those gates let them all hang out oh my god <laughs> they're killing each close other close the gate close the <laughs> gate. oh god oh god oh no 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 1962, there he is again, George Lincoln Rockwell visits neo-Nazis in the United Kingdom, and they form an umbrella organization, the World Union of National Socialists. Yep, I knew I was right. It sounds vaguely superhero-ish. It's like the Secret League of Justice. Yeah. The the World Union of National Socialists is the Russians... League of... What was was Uh, the... League of Extraordinary General. I was thinking of the Klansmen. No, but what's what are rich what are what are superheroes get in? Justice League? Justice League. Yeah. Yeah. The, the World Russian. Union of National Socialists is the Russian Justice League. Wait, why is it Russian? Because socialists aren't they Oh, they're communists in Russia. Yeah, socialists was Nazis. Nazis. Oh fuck. All right. Whatever. I'm not as smart as I thought I was. That's all right. June twenty eighth, nineteen. Fuck Russia while we're at it. Yeah, fuck Russia. And honestly, f- I, do, I believe there's a form of socialism that can work, like if you mix socialism and capitalism, but I believe pure socialism has never worked at any point in time it, in any country. It's ever. a it's a honestly it's a word I'm too dumb to understand. Like because people have such hard takes on it, I'm like, maybe I'm thinking of something else. Well, I just think we need to mix the thing of capital I mean, I don't want to get into politics. Yeah, yeah, capitalism, totally. socialism. Socialism can it seems to work in most countries when it happens, like in the beginning, but then it's too easy for a crazy person to get in charge and then once they're in charge of everything you're you're getting, they can you know what's funny is like this proves that white supremacy is like still rampant in our political system because just trying to talk about this without getting into politics, I keep wanting to jump into like, <laughs> like yeah, but everything happening now. Now it's the same shit, but just in a smaller scale, but the same shit. So right. in 1967, George Lincoln Rockwell is assassinated by his former follower in front of his home. Three years later, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood is Brotherhood is formed in secret. Allegedly in San Quentin Prison. Shout out to Northern California. Yeah, we out yeah. here. We out I went here. to preschool like right across the water from it. Really? Yeah, I could see it from like our playground. And little did I know that some of my heroes were in there. <laughs> 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 I'm totally kidding. For yeah. everyone at home, I feel like I should. It has very a disclaimer. Whenever I thought of San Quentin, I always thought of like prisoner of Azkaban type prison. Oh, interesting. Like a little Grand Wizardy? A little Grand... Yeah, there's a lot of wizards going in there. Someone call 
whatever that bitch's name was. I wish I remembered more things. Whatever. What's so the woman? We played J.K. Rowling. Yeah. yeah, I got a lot of had trauma. I used, had trauma. I used to do the thing where they used to press on my chest too, so you'd pass out. Oh uh, yeah, a kid too. You did yeah, that you're a definitely lot. forgetting stories from here on out. Yeah, I don't even remember who George Lincoln Rockwell was. <laughs> Motivated largely by profiting from criminal activity, they become the largest and most dangerous prison gang in America. Almost still to this date, though, the uh, Mexican Mafia are pretty high up there. The opponents became black prison gangs in the Irish mob. That's interesting that the Irish never counted as white. I they, And especially here, this is like 1970. This right. is like the 40s. Right. It's just the accent. And how big was the Irish mob in Northern California? For real. Uh, the, the, that being said, uh, the uh, Aryan Brotherhood does team up with Mexican gangs in prison most of the time, though, you know, they keep them at like a lower level, but uh, they they do join up with them, which I always thought was an interesting thing. But, you know, you got to get your numbers up. Yeah. And I think they just kind of went against black people. Mm -hmm, the enemy of my enemy. Yep. So here we go up into double D's. This sweet piece of shit. David Duke, 1974, a member of the American Nazi Party, citing the example of George Lincoln Rockwell, he creates the KKKK, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Based originally in Louisiana, it becomes an umbrella organization for previously localized and independent Klan and white supremacist groups. So David Duke is the guy who comes back, and we're going to do a little dive on David Duke right here a little bit. It's going to be a little fun. We'll learn a little bit. Um, David Ernest Duke. Born July 1st, 1950. I'm not going to give my son or daughter a middle name. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. I'm just, I'm just going to put that out there now. I think middle names are racist. Mm -hmm. I think they're problematic. My my kid's middle name is going to be Nice Try. Nice Try. <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> David Ernest Duke, still alive today, that piece of shit's running around. He was born July 1st, 1950. He's an American neo-Nazi anti-Semite. Conspiracy theorist, far-right politician, convicted felon, and former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. From 1989 to 1992, he was a member of the Louisiana House of Representatives. Like, it's, you can't touch this guy without being racist. Yeah, like, there's, there's no way. You're just like, ah, oh, he's, no, he's nice cool. Guy. Like, I don't think so, dog. Look Bro. at his fucking track record. Yeah. His publication and politics are largely devoted to prom promoting conspiracy theories about Jews, such as Holocaust denial and Jewish control of the academia, the press, and the financial system. The Anti-Defamation League has described Duke as perhaps America's most well-known racist and anti-Semite. Great, great uh, credit for him, though, right? <laughs> Yeah, you could just say in my intro when I go on stage, just, you know, most, most racist uh, anti-Semite. By the Anti-Defamation League. So please just remember, Anti-Defamation League, America's most well-known racist anti-Semite. Just remember that. And, and I'll be in Tampa on the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> Duke unsuccessfully stood as Democratic candidate for state legislature during the 1970s and 1980s. Culminating in his campaign in, campaign in 1988 Democratic presidential nomination, after failing to gain any traction within the Democratic Party, Duke left and successfully gained the presidential nominee of the Minor Populist Party. In 1988, in December, he became a Republican and claimed to have become a born-again Christian, renouncing anti-Semitism and racism. Whoa. Yeah. He soon won his only elected office, a seat in the Louisiana House of Representatives, Perfect timing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really. Suspiciously perfect timing. Amen. Now man. that I need your vote, I love. My heart is filled with love. For race? <laughs> For Jews? <gasps> All right. Bitch? I'm not shaking his hand, but I will look him in the eye. <laughs> Piece of shit, man. Oh, Louisiana. Interesting, interesting place. So we're going to do a quick little overview of the reemergence of the Klan and Nazism in the United States from 1950 to 1970. The role of white supremacy in the United States comes under more scrutiny after the American victory over Nazi Germany, especially given the role of African Americans in both the military and the war industry. Industry. I mean, great point. Like at this time, you know, when you see these things, you see these guys fighting for this stuff and doing everything and still not giving the respect that they should have had. Mm -hmm. But it is coming back more. You know what I mean? Like, these like people are more realizing that being a white supremacist. I mean, I mean Hitler. I mean, he was a white supremacist, but he was also like anti a bunch of 
different white people shit. But they're just right. seeing that this stuff is problematic, and they're seeing that these African Americans, the one who went and they fought for war, badasses, the ones who stu- stayed here and helped us fight these guys, are good. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's not the way it should. Like they didn't treat them how they should be, but it's yeah. getting better. A surge in violence against African Americans in the South is characterized by the emergence of a new version of the Ku Klux Klan. Decentralized groups of white supremacists focus on protecting racial segregation in the South. This is almost fucking what is it? The seventies? This one yeah, is. Jesus, it's almost man. damn near a hundred years later. Yeah, that this shit is still going on. Yeah. <clears throat> Their campaign of terror is marked by bombing of black churches, businesses, and home. Brown v. Board of Education mandates desegregation, leading to the emergence of the modern civil rights movement. The Klan commits its most heinous crimes in the aftermath. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church and the abduction and murder of three civil rights volunteers. Just like like you said, like where gangs are kind of like killing other gangs, and you're sort of like, well, I mean, this is the game. This is how it goes. But, what I mean, this is so much worse. These are, like, kids and innocent people just driving home from volunteering at a church, getting murdered and kidnapped. Some of the most bitch-made shit, bro, is that, like, these guys, I think it was Rockwell or maybe one of the guys we were going to talk about early, would go to, like, Louis Farrakhan speeches and, like, watch them and, like, go to Malcolm X speeches and watch them and, like, not bomb those like i feel like if you were like a white supremacist and you were scared about black people overtaking white like people those were the you would look at these two guys yeah yeah whereas in essence they were bombing people that are good and right going, it's like fight someone your own size exactly dude. not saying like bomb yeah. a farrakhan speech, no no exactly but, but it's just like why aren't you going against yeah like if you were like this guy i mean listen farrakhan might have a bunch of good things to do i mean i'm not a huge fan personally but like it's the equivalent of me, like, hating you, but instead I go and, like, kill your little sister. Yeah, but then you, know? you go to all my comedy shows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, bro, you're a bitch. Yeah, fight me. Yeah, right. You fucking psychopath. Right. All right. Um, Rockwell, okay. No, 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 probably not. Okay. Driven primarily by his opposition to the civil rights movement, George Lincoln Rockwell forms the American Nazi Party in 1959. Rockwell visits the United Kingdom and connects with neo-Nazis and Nazis established in Europe. The meeting results in the creation of the World Union of National Socialists, an umbrella organization that supports far-right, fascist, and anti-communist organizations. My thing is, like, fascism, isn't that, I don't know, I feel like communism and fascism, socialism, there's always, like, a guy in power at the top that's evil yeah yeah no one will ever realize that i know maybe i'm too dumb but i feel like a lot of stuff in the beginning it all ends that way yeah it just ends that way rockwell places the german salute of sig Heil and populates the new phrase white power amongst his followers rockwell is eventually assassinated by a fellow neo-nazi in the dispute outside of his home but his ideological ideology and influence endears in other right-wing organizations such as the John Birch Society and the Minutemen, some led by former members of the fascist Silver Shirts. Uh, we're going to go a little bit more into David Duke. David Duke, a radical pro-segregationist, anti-communist, founds the Knights of Ku Klux Klan, a former adherent of the George Lincoln Rockwell ideology. His local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan becomes an umbrella group for Klan chapters and white supremacists. The organizations, through damn Though damaged by federal investigations in the South, spread to the West Coast and Midwest, for the first time, the Klan becomes allied with neo-Nazi movements in the United States. Mm, so they were separate until... Yeah. And uh, I mean, because I mean... I never knew that. I mean, honestly, the thing of... Uh, I mean, it's just one sentence, but uh, through damage by the federal investigations in the South, spreads to the West Coast and Midwest is such a huge sense in the white supremacist organization text because i mean sacramento in the bay area we're not quite pacific northwest but we're there yeah but we've driven up there enough and there's racist weirdos there yeah even the tip of northern california tip of northern california which is you know like that but Shasta also southern area. california yeah Shasta, right and, but also southern california like yeah. huntington beach is one of the biggest uh, you know, skinhead group areas. At, yeah. At, whereas I feel like San Francisco and because I was in Sacramento my whole time, I never knew any skinheads. Right. I mean, I knew guys that were just older, like kind of racist guys, but mm-hmm. not like guys like these. So it's interesting to see that it was kind of more a Southern California in a Pacific Northwest thing. And I know of guys that like get into trouble with the law, and then you go into jail or prison, 
and you're white. Yeah, it's like, you gotta bro, go. You gotta t- get tatted up, and you have, and now you got a swastika tatted on your neck because you don't want to get fucked in the shower. Yeah, I'd be like, can we just put it on my upper thigh? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, no, no, no. I love, love Hitler. I love put Hitler. it as close to my butt Hitler. as possible. Hitler. That yeah. when he goes to really, he's like, oh my god, I had no idea. <laughs> it's like one of those things. Your Nazi butt tattoo is like one of those little things that you make <laughs> as a kid. Oh yeah, what are those called? Coochie ketter, coo- cootie ketchers. So it's so like, like one, two, three, three, four. four and and oh, Hitler color. was a <laughs> Hitler was a prophet. Okay, well you're gonna stay with us then. That is an elaborate tat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, okay. And on to the next one: the emergence of the Aryan Brotherhood in skinhead gangs, 1970s to 1990s. This is our second to the last uh, era. I'm putting in some time here. Damn, very good. We're doing pretty good. 1960s: the skinhead movement in Britain coalesces out of the working class opposition to British conservatism and the upper class mod movement in the hippie movement of the 1960s. Emerges working class pride with Jamaican rude boy culture in British cities and its followers are largely white and black Britons. So Whoa. But this is more cuz I thought the same thing. This is more the skinhead movement. But like Jamaican rude boy culture, maybe I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you about it in a second. Okay, okay, okay. okay. But keep going. You can keep talking about it before. No, no, no. I want to hear about it. So the term rude boy and the rude boy subculture arose from the poor sections of Kingston, Jamaica, and was associated with violent, discontented youths, along with ska and rock steady music. Many rude boys favored kind of these sharp suits, thin hat, thin ties, pork belly hats, and they kind of showed in fashion of like american jazz musicians hmm. and then in the 60s in the 60s the jamaican dysphoria introduced rude boy music and fashion in the united kingdom which influenced the mod and skinhead subcultures and one it's just wild that a trend in kingston J- jamaica in yeah. the 50s and 60s can follow itself to the skinhead movement in america it's crazy that it's like we're gonna borrow them they're like man this is a great idea where'd you get this just kind of came up with it <laughs> on my own. What's that? What's what are you holding behind you? Is that a, a Bob lot, Marley and the Whalers <laughs> album? <laughs> There's a lot of steel drums in these races <laughs> in our racist songs. Nah, man. No, no, no. I don't know what you're talking about. It's like you just crossed out black, black in everything and wrote white. white. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not true. But we're gonna eat some plantains at our next Idaho racist movement. <laughs> So that's pretty interesting, you know, that that kind of thing happened. And then, you know, cut, kind of what happens here is like more the, the skinheads go really away. This is what the 70s to late 80s. They go away from this kind of ska thing into more just like punk. And that's kind of where they get their outfits of like, you know, like a fucking bomber jacket, black pants and boots. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They're like the guys who hung out at the back at the ska con. It's like, yeah. Whoa, man. They start right. migrating from yeah. the guy who's like, first timer here. <laughs> Flannel shirt. <laughs> You see another guy shaved his eyebrows. Like, oh, you've been here a couple times. <laughs> you skinned your. Whole tells head. me you didn't have to buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you knew the door guy, huh? Okay. Early 1970s, Richard Butler, a former silver shirt, founds the Aryan Nations in Idaho. He merges Nazi ideology with freeing Christian identity movement. Richard Butler did a little thing on Richard Butler, just mm. a smaller one. Richard Gernt Butler, uh, night uh, February Gernt. 20- Gernt. <laughs> What a name. Gernt. It's got this of some flags popping up on that one, I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. February 23rd, 1918 to September 8th, 2004. He was an American engineer and white supremacist after dating him, dedicating himself to the Christian identity movement, a racial offsuit of British Israel, Israelism. Hmm. Butler founded the neo-Nazi Aryan Nations and would become the spiritual godfather to the white supremacist movement in which he was a leading figure. He has been described as a notorious racist. So he moved to Idaho and kind of just had his own thing going in Idaho. And, you know, um, as being a coastal elite, yeah. I do tend to look down on the middle places. And mm-hmm. what, what he started doing is he would take his uh, little racist group and they would have these parades in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And the Idaho people were like, fuck this. And they made up this little task group and they kicked the shit out of these guys and they kicked them out of their little town. Or and, and they really came to bat and did a really, really good job hmm. in kicking out this guy. 
That's awesome. Because I was going to say, like, I don't want to shit on Idaho, but I feel like, again, you target these areas where there's just not a lot going on. And that's what he did. He moved from Palmdale. He was another Southern California. The amount of racist skinhead. Well, skinheads come pretty much from Southern California. Yeah, not like neo Yeah, it is Something weird. Something in the air, the water. It's I like don't know. Native American, like, lost souls of hate are just, like, in the water. Yeah, we're buried. Our whole city's on an Indian burial ground. Yeah. So in 2000, Victoria and Jason Keenan, a Native American mother and son, were harassed at gunpoint by Aryan Nations members successfully. And then they successfully sued Butler. Represented by local attorney Norm Gissel and Morris D's Montgomery, Alabama based Southern Poverty Law Center, they won a combined civil judgment of six point three million dollars from Butler and the Aryan Nation members who attacked them. Good for them. Good for them. And I was kind of seeing this. They were I, harassed. They weren't even like Yeah, well, I mean, from what I understand, it was like pretty gnarly shit. They had a gun in their face and all oh, that kind of fuck. stuff. Okay. But it was just uh you never see anybody sue the Crips. Right. Or anything like that. Right. I don't know if just like white guys were just LLCing and incorporating or everything. It just we wasn't do. illegal to form a hate group. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what, but this was in 2000. Right. The cus- couple also received his compound, which I loved, yeah. in which they later donated to the North Idaho College, who turned it into a peace park. Oh, I love that, dude. I Slap love in the that. fucking face, man. Not even sold it. They donated it for a yeah. peace park. So this guy, where he had his racist shit going in from what? God damn, what was he? The nineteen set, the early seventies to about two thousand. It's like, hey, we know gay marriage is still illegal here in two thousand, but we're gonna do gay commitment ceremonies in your fucking master bedroom yeah. of your compound. Yeah, yeah. There's an assless chaps <laughs> gathering <laughs> fan group in your fucking bedroom. In uh, September two thousand. Uh, Oh, this was really gross, actually. This was one I just put in there. In September 2000, fellow Sandpoint, Idaho millionaire Vincent Bertolini provided Butler with a new house in Hayden, Idaho. So I wanted to do a little bit more interest on Vincent Bertolini, but this thing started getting out of control. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah. It's, like, too long of a story? It's just we got it. I mean, we're only about a half right now. Yeah. So, But, yeah, the guy, I don't know. I guess he was just a crazy racist or something, but... Wrong side of history to get on, man. This guy's whatever. Dude, rich people, they just, they never hear no, and then it's like. You know what? I think to be like uber rich, like the the elite evils, you know, yeah. I think you got to have something pushing you, yeah. whether it's pedophilia, whether it's racism, whether it's anti-Semitism. Cartel ties. Because something. Yeah. It's just you got to have something to push you so far to being like, you and I both want to be rich, but we don't want to be like rock. I mean, we'd like to be Rockefellers, but I don't care about running right i don't want to be in too deep yeah like it's just like i want to live well but if you're like a guy who you have to hide out how racist you are or how much you want to fuck kids the only Mm -hmm. way to do that is to cocoon yourself with millions of dollars that's why i feel like there's got to be something on richard branson that we just haven't found out yet he hasn't done anything no, he hasn't done it. He's fallen off a little recently. But, I mean, that Norton guy, that Norton antivirus oh, guy. Oh, that guy's a fucking whack job. Yeah, I saw that documentary. It was pretty great. He fucking lost his mind. He had a very cocaine energy, though. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like the drugs talking. I honestly believe that. You can kind of see when people get into meth or all these things, they start taking these crazy ideas, and then Branson, or not Branson, the other guy, Norton, got like a weird gang to run his shit. Okay, so this is a, this is where, like I said, I mean, to say it becomes more interesting, but it's more of more, uh, I understand what's going on. 1978, the 